Well, I hope you uh, notice the theme this morning as we move throughout our worship service, that it's about cultivating an awareness of the presence of God in us and among us. Because we're focusing in particular this morning on how to discern the voice of God or how to discern when something truly is of God. So we start by looking at a homecoming in Nazareth. The people of Nazareth came to hear their hometown boy. They had heard what he had been doing. They'd heard about some of the miracles and the healings, no doubt. So they had come to see for themselves what the buzz was all about. So Jesus shows up at the synagogue, as was his custom. He was Jewish, of course, so he would have been familiar with the custom of attending. And as a guest that day, they offered him that he should read from the scroll. And so he does, and we're told that all the people spoke well of Jesus, that they were amazed at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. Of course, it took about 30 seconds for them to, to decide that what they really wanted to do was hurl him off of the side of a cliff. I don't know if you caught that in this reading, but verse 22, all were amazed and spoke well of him. Verse 29, they led him to the edge of a hill so that they could hurl him off the cliff. What in the world happened? I don't know why they were so angry. I mean, this was kind of violent stuff here. And interestingly, I kind of think Jesus was poking the bear just a little bit. Let me tell you what I mean by that. These people thought they knew Jesus. They were from his hometown, after all. He was Joseph's son. They knew Joseph. They knew Jesus. But Jesus knew them better. Now let's not forget that what he had just read from the scroll moments earlier was a reading from the prophet Isaiah, where Isaiah was prophesying a year of favor that would fall on the people, when the blind would find sight, the captives would be released, the oppressed would be relieved, and the poor of this world would all know good news. But Jesus, in reading this scroll, is not thinking locally. He's thinking globally. He's thinking all the blind will see, all the captives will be freed, all the oppressed will find relief. The poor of all the world will receive special privileges now. And so he says to the people there gathered in his hometown, I know what you're thinking. I know you. You're thinking, prove it. Prove who you are by healing us like we heard you healed those other people in Capernaum. And then Jesus goes on to remind them in no uncertain terms that the prophet Elijah went to the widow in Sidon. That the prophet Elisha went to the leper in Syria. He's making it clear that he intends to go well beyond the confines of Israel in order to help make his kingdom known. Jesus' ministry is for all, Jew and Gentile alike. Now, in saying this, Jesus was threatening everything that they thought they knew. Everything they thought they knew about religion, about who's in, who's out, what a hometown hero should look like. He threatened their very sense of security. He called out their certainty. And it made them seething mad. You might remember that in John's Gospel, we get this lovely account of Jesus sharing a meal with his disciples on the night before he was killed. And it was a beautiful evening Aside from the betrayal of Judas, of course, the evening was full of love and encouragement. And then Jesus comes to the point in chapter 15 of John's Gospel where he says sort of ominously, when you go out into the world, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. This was a hate that was 
born out of a place of comfort. It was born out of a place of certitude. Certitude is the absolute conviction that what we firmly believe is true. There's no changing our minds. That's certitude. My youngest brother, both of my brothers actually are adopted. My youngest brother is adopted and native Alaskan. And uh, he was adopted at birth. And he's from the Yupik tribe. When I was in junior high school, a few friends who I'd just met recently commented, of course, on the difference in the way that we look. And I explained to them that he was Eskimo, which is what we said then. Now the, the more politically correct term, more inclusive term is um, Native Alaskan. But I'd said he was Eskimo. And they said, no, he's not. And I said, oh, no, 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 he is. He's adopted, of course, duh. And they said, no, he can't be. He can't be that. And I said, no, he is. And they said, no, no, he might be Mexican, but he can't be Eskimo. Mexican they could get. They had seen Mexican people in our community. They had seen Mexican immigrants. They had gone out for Mexican food. Eskimo? He's not Eskimo. And I'll never forget how baffling it was to sit and argue with, something who, with someone who had no idea what they were talking about and were utterly convinced they were right. And my takeaway from that was just that we can get so locked into our own personal experience of a thing that we cannot see anything else. We cannot see that something else might be true. That story, that, that incident in my own life has stayed with me. So I'm thinking today of our friends in Nazareth. Really, Jesus? Syria? Sidon? Not Nazareth? off the cliffside with you. Throwing someone we disagree with off of the proverbial cliff is easy, isn't it? The harder thing to do, the more uncomfortable, more vulnerable thing to do, is to try to see someone else's perspective. It always strikes me that the group of people in Jesus' hometown didn't ask one question. They didn't seek to understand at all. They just grouped together in a little mob and started inching their way over to the side of a cliff. 400 years ago, people threw Galileo off of a cliff, if you will, for daring to say that it was the sun and not the earth that was the center of the universe. 200 years ago, Abe Lincoln was thrown off of a cliff, if you will, because abolishing slavery threatened the Constitution as people understood it and a way of life that benefited only certain people. Martin Luther King was thrown off a cliff. We throw people off cliffs all the time, don't we? When we are so certain of life and our place in it, how can we be open to God doing a new thing? How do we trust what God might be up to when we are already so certain we know. The theologian Robert Mulholland calls this kind of certitude that borders on anger and rage our false self. Throwing someone off of the metaphorical cliff is the work of the false self. It's the false self, he says, because it represents the part of us that roots our very being in something other than God. It's the part of ourselves that fears we might lose out if someone else gains an advantage. It's the part of ourselves that says, I only matter if I'm the one benefiting. It's the part of ourselves that says, I have to protect myself because nobody else will. Think about if you've ever driven a car and someone cuts you off into your lane or, or frightens you a little bit as they're scooching too close. Do you ever get angry or frustrated? You have a sense of trying to protect your lane? That's what we're talking about here. The false self is concerned with advantage. What's in it for me? How do I protect mine? 
the false self aligns with other people who think like we do because it validates the opinions and the ideas that we have while at the same time making someone who doesn't share those same ideas and opinions wrong. This is what happened with the Pharisees. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, it was extremely difficult for them to see that maybe God was at work in the world in a new way. And this is also what was happening with the people in Nazareth. The false self is trying to jockey for position because it feels that whatever station it has attained in life, whatever it has struggled to get, needs to be protected at all costs. If I share my place in the world with others, it might cost me something that I don't want to give up. The false self is rooted in ego, self-image, self-worth, me, individuality. The true self is rooted in God and is concerned with protecting what is God's. But it can be very confusing to know what is God's and what is ours, can't it? How do I know when something is really coming from God? We all get messages every day. Gosh, how can we not? We are bombarded 24-7 with messages and images and information and opinions and ideas. And we frankly pride ourselves on what we discern is right and true. But how do we know when it's really God that is speaking to us? How do we discern whether or not we do need to change our own thinking? Listen more, not throw someone over a cliff. Like the prophet Jeremiah, who we also heard about this morning, Jeremiah wondered aloud to God, who, me? I'm only a boy. Like Samuel before him, Samuel heard God calling and mistook his voice for someone else. He thought it was the priest, Eli, that was calling him. Samuel had to tune himself to God's voice so that it would become an unmistakable point of reference for him in his life. The work of discernment is one of the hallmarks of our Christian faith. Wise discernment is referred to over and over again in scripture. But to discern God's voice, we have to have a relationship with God. How many of you, upon picking up the phone when it rings, would recognize your mother's voice at the first hello? How many of you, yes, exactly. How many of you would recognize your father's voice, your children's voice, your spouse, your best friend, right? These are voices that we are tuned to. I recognize these voices because they are so precious to me and I've known them my whole life. I am in relationship with them, so I recognize them instantly. I remember when our children were little, um, if one of them came to us in the middle of the night with a bad dream or an upset tummy, I knew which one was walking down that hall by the sound of their footsteps. That's how close they are to our hearts. Even today, I can tell by my kids' hello if they're happy or distressed, sad, tired. I know their voices almost better than I know my own, if not better. Jesus says to us, my sheep know my voice. What a great metaphor. If you've ever seen a shepherd with their sheep, you know that the sheep will totally ignore the voice of someone they don't recognize if it's not their shepherd. But then when the shepherd calls, it is distinct and recognizable to them. My sheep know my voice. That only happens when we spend time cultivating an awareness of God's voice as separate and apart from others. So, how do we do that? Well, first, 
We have to want to be able to discern God's voice. We have to believe also that God's voice will make a difference for us in sorting out challenges, in understanding difference with other people, in finding a new way forward. We have to want to tap into that part of us that is our true self, connected to that divine wisdom. And that's going to take letting go of a little certitude. Even though with that intention and desire to hear God's voice, we often just slide through life in a way that offers little to no opportunities for connection, little to no opportunity for paying attention. And then we wonder why we're not hearing God. Why is he not talking to me? I don't know about you, but I tend to do pretty well um, connecting to God when things in my life are are really relatively calm. I can set aside that time for morning meditation and prayer, spiritual work throughout the day. I do a lot worse when life gets busy. Now, I know some people who are the opposite. When things are busy and they are under pressure, they really set aside that time to connect. And then when things are going relatively well, they forget, they get complacent. But here's what I want us to hear today, regardless of where you might fall on that spectrum of connecting. If discernment enables us to see the work of God in our lives, to hear the voice of God, our shepherd, and to be steeped in listening and responding to God, if discernment enables us to do all of that work, then the habit of spirituality precedes the practice of discernment. The habits of spirituality are the foundation for this growing relationship with God. If, for example, your goal is to get so close to your beloved that you recognize their voice, well then the spiritual practices of God are like the dating part of our relationship, right? So what are your habits? What are your spiritual habits? Being here is one of them for sure. Joining in community with others where we can feel that connection together, palpably feel that. What else? What are your habits of spirituality that deepen and broaden your understanding of God in the world and your place in God's kingdom? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Before we can discern the voice of God, we have to spend time with God, be in relationship with God, be attentive to God at work in the world. So I encourage you today to really consider what are my habits? What can I add to that toolbox? We live in a time where it can be very, very difficult to discern God's voice. Even Christians disagree about where God is leading us. There are some very tricky social and political issues going on in the world, and Christians are not immune to that. But one thing I know to the very core of my being is that wherever God is leading us, it will be good. It will be good. The call to love God and love others is ultimately our calling as Christians. That is the goal. Ruth Haley Barton writes that in every decision we make, we could hope that somewhere along the way we consider what would love call us to do in every decision we make. And I think we'd be hard pressed to find a time in our lives where the answer to that question would be contempt fury, self-righteousness, dehumanization, hate. God's intentions for us are always good. And that includes God's intentions for people that we've closed our hearts and our minds to. When love is the foundation in our lives, then these dogmatic differences that seem insurmountable will be removed. 
heart of discernment then is asking, what would love have us do? That's the question we must ask ourselves and then listen deeply and attentively for the answers. It's an examination of our conscience in a way. It's tough stuff, but deep inner work always is. I love the prayer of examine, it's called, by St. Ignatius, which I think you might find helpful too this morning, so I want to share the steps of it. It's a set of prompts that you follow, um, and you can adapt them as you like, but it encourages some daily introspection in a very simple way. Now, interestingly, before becoming a priest, St. Ignatius, who's the founder of the Jesuit um, order of priesthood. He lived in the 1500s, and he was a former soldier, actually, and he was quite well known for taking great care with his recruits and their spiritual well-being while in the midst of the military and battles and whatever ensued in his day. So he developed a set of practices like the one I'm going to share to help his recruits with their spiritual well-being. So the examine goes like this. Uh, At the end of a day, just take a few minutes to look back on the day. And you begin with thanksgiving, with gratitude. What am I especially grateful for this day? Then you move to a petition before God. So before really reviewing the day, but after offering gratitude, You ask God then to help you know yourself as God sees you. Not as the world sees you, not as you see yourself, but ask God to help you see through God's eyes who you really are. Then you're going to review the day. Where have I felt joy today? Where have I felt troubled? What challenged me today? Where did I pause today, if at all? What angered me? Why? Have I noticed God's presence in any of this? And then after the review of the day, you're going to respond by asking, in light of my review, what is my response to my day? to my behavior, to the ways in which I showed up for the world. And then finally, you're going to look ahead. With what spirit do I want to enter into tomorrow? So it's Thanksgiving, petition, review, response, and look ahead. Some of you might be familiar with the prayer of examine, but practices like this can often help us develop that rich interior life. In this season of Epiphany, which we're still in, we are still piecing together all of the light that is found in the story of Jesus coming into the world. That's our work right now. And I'm reminded of Barbara Brown Taylor's urging in her book, beautiful book called An Altar in the World. She writes, she says that our work is to become detectives of the divine. Coming into deeper relationship with God makes us want to place more emphasis on what new thing God is doing in the world and focus less on the ways that we have always been and the things we have always held to be so true. Maybe to hold our own opinions a little bit lightly. We live in a fragmented world. So let's take some time to really listen, you and I, to voices that are different from our own, to the voices of the oppressed, to the voices of the powerless. Listen to the voices around us. And then let's go within to discern what God might be calling us to hear 
and what God might be calling us to do. Amen. Let us pray.